Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session. My name is Lexi Harvey, and I'm a group manager on Zendesk's Global Strategics Events team. Today, I will be sharing insights into Zendesk's Events Playbook. All right, so let's get into it. A bit about me, I have been at Zendesk for four and a half years, leading event marketing and production for Zendesk's virtual, in-person, and hybrid customer-facing events. Prior to Zendesk, I've worked primarily in event marketing at tech companies in San Francisco. And for those who aren't too familiar, Zendesk provides a complete customer service solution to over 145,000 customers across the globe. We are headquartered in San Francisco with 15 global offices. To set some context for Zendesk's events portfolio, we host over 80 webinars, 35 virtual events, and 90 in-person events annually. As Zendesk webinars are shorter form, single presentation or talk, while our virtual events are tied to our marquee marketing moments, usually around our campaigns and include multiple types of content. Our in-person events range from field events to regional user conferences and our flagship customer conference relate. Zendesk events are hosted globally, delivered in up to 13 languages, and we have a team of marketers touching events across all of the regions. My team is responsible for curating the global event strategy and driving regional enablement. So today I'm going to share insights into Zendesk's events playbook, how we approach event design and content creation to build brand recognition and drive real results. We will definitely have time at the end for Q&A as well. So core to Zendesk's events playbook, the three key areas that we will focus on today are experiment and iterate to keep your events fresh, drive consistency to align with brand ethos, and maintain a two-way street with viewers. And this is just what we do here at Zendesk, but hopefully you can walk away with some ideas to take back to your team. So the first area we will dive into is an emphasis on experimenting and iterating to keep your events fresh. You will hear experimentation is a common theme across our playbook. And while we don't want to recreate the wheel each time, we always look for ways in which we can iterate on our event design and attendee experience. So what does that look like in practical terms? Here are some things we have done. To keep our events fresh, we experiment with different event and content formats, test playful content and look for ways to connect with our content creatively, say that five times fast, and we always look to maximize our virtual event experience. So for nearly every virtual event series we produce, we find ways to experiment with different formats and event content. And some of the ways in which we do that are by switching up event formats to combat short attention spans and adapt to changing audience preferences. We used to lean pretty heavily into highly produced pre-recorded content and events, but in the past year, we've started to incorporate more live components into our agendas directly related to audience feedback. And we've seen great success when using both pre-recorded and live formats together. Most recently, we've been using a short pre-recorded video as the tee up for a live follow-on conversation. It's a great way to get more life out of existing video content, if you have it, and still bring a bit of show and polish to a mostly live event. We've also seen great engagement when focusing live sessions on when it matters most. Sessions that facilitate Q&A, learning, and action. A live fireside chat or a panel discussion, of course, can be super insightful, but we wanted to explore other ways to drive participation. So for example, our attendee survey responses and chat engagement told us that our audience was looking for access to Zendesk product experts. They wanted to get their product questions answered. So we experimented by hosting, basically it was a live office hours at the end of our, a virtual event, and it was a hit. The questions continued to flow in long after the allocated time, and our customers were able to get their question answered by product experts. So that format, we experimented with it, and now it's being widely used across Zendesk events across the globe. And we've even talked about how can we iterate on it to bring the concept to our in-person events. Live sessions that give viewers the opportunity to connect on a deeper level with product or a thought leader will provide more value and we keep them coming back for more. And lastly, we've had a ton of fun experimenting with our event platform. We really take the time to play with the different features and get creative with what we have. 
Our team has come up with brilliant ways to support the attendee experience through imagery, for example, when the event platform can't support in the way that we're envisioning. And we've also experimented with capabilities like attendee chat. We've turned that on and off. Surveys, what's the best place in the platform to drive the most responses? And virtual sponsor booths. We have to question, is it really providing value to our partners? So for a lot of these capabilities that we've experimented with, if we don't see great engagement, we turn them off. Keep your attendees focused on what matters most and find the features that fit best with your content. But all this to say, don't shy away from thinking outside of the box and looking for those creative workarounds to craft the best, best experience. So as we know, average attention spans have dwindled down to just over eight seconds. So we have to continue to experiment so that we can discover what works best for our audience. Another way we strive to keep our events fresh is for by looking for ways to connect to the content in a creative and fun way. Here are some things that we've tested, seen success with, and iterated on. We love to look for ways to leverage existing video content when possible. We'll take a five minute video and cut it up into 90 second bits to weave into our virtual events. It makes the content more digestible for viewers and those short attention spans. And of course, the smaller videos make great social media assets. We've also had fun with interstitials, upbeat music, trivia, unexpected bloopers. These are relatively easy to execute elements that can really make your brand's personality shine. Interesting speakers, an Arctic explorer, an AI artist, or even a rock star can be a great way to draw an audience while still connecting back to your overarching message. And we've done this on multiple scales. We've had them give a full presentation and also two minute cameo style videos that they film from their iPhone. And lastly, if you can, look for ways to incorporate a moment of levity. Our creative team came up with the idea to put a hall of gratuitous praise in our virtual expo area. And if you don't know what that is, YouTube it later when you need to pick me up. Uh, it was very memorable and unexpected and definitely very Zendesk. So when you are experimenting with this type of creative content, do so on a smaller scale before scaling up and using more widely. And even if you are using mostly live video, you can still top and tail with playful content, or you can share it in a pre-event email or incorporate it into your event platform. The third area where we spend a lot of time experimenting is with the goal to maximize our virtual event and on-demand experience. We've heard from our customers that they prefer consuming content digitally, mainly driven by the convenience and flexibility of a post-pandemic digital first world. So with that in mind, we continue to keep digital at the forefront of our event strategy and incorporate elements that will upscale the experience for both virtual events and our in-person broadcasts. A couple of things we do to upscale the experience are exploring integrations and plugins that will improve the attendee experience, such as Vimeo's live streaming services to ensure a high quality stream and stable platform. We use Vimeo for every single virtual event because it's just table stakes that you need a reliable experience for your attendees. And we typically use services like Kudo and SyncWords to provide simultaneous translation and closed captioning services to effectively scale our events across the globe and reach more audiences. And when we do live broadcasting, we invest in multi-shot cameras to provide more movement for our online viewers. We take the time to ensure the broadcast is optimized for the digital experience. But as a reminder, you don't need to invest financially in full-scale production for it to feel elevated. It can be add-on services that you scale up or scale down to suit your needs. And because we know our customers are consuming so much on-demand content these days, we have to continue to prioritize the on-demand strategy as well. At Zendesk, tracking on-demand views used to feel like a bonus on top of our live attendee numbers. And now we heavily rely on on-demand to help us reach our targets. So don't let your on-demand strategy get overlooked. There's solid engagement these days for viewing and consuming content post-event and on-demand. And yes, we know in-person events are back in full swing, but viewers are telling us that digital still reigns. So to summarize this section, experiment with different formats, playful content, and your virtual event platform to keep your events fresh.
A key area of focus in Zendesk's playbook is also around the importance of driving consistency to align with brand ethos. Maintaining brand consistency in events is crucial for ensuring that your audience has a clear understanding of who you are as a brand and what values you represent. So to drive brand consistency across Zendesk events, we stay grounded with an event system, and then we scale by creating an event kit that will enable on-brand events across the globe. So at the core of Zendesk's events portfolio is a clearly defined event system. The event system was designed to meet the requirements of the business. We looked into the overall business strategy, global marketing initiatives, regional needs, and the audience perspective. So from there, we were able to define and categorize events into event types. And for each event type, there are naming and messaging guardrails, as well as branding. Each one has its own look and feel. So with the system and framework in place, we can ensure teams across the globe are representing the brand appropriately and driving consistency through their events. And with the centralized event system also comes the responsibility to represent the brand through everything that we put out into the world. As the strategic events team, we consult with cross-functional partners on their event strategy, agenda development, speaker selection, and event design all components of an event that represent the brand ethos. We act as an advocate for our creative partners when we collaborate on these events across the globe. We are their extra eyes and ears looking out for what may seem like the smallest of details, but ultimately impact the consistency in the long run. But your brand recognition will soar when there is consistency with event branding. Now, one of the most successful tactics I think that we have been able to do that have really helped us to drive brand consistency across our global events is to leverage an event kit, as we like to call it. We create event kits for each campaign motion, and they are used primarily by our regional marketing teams who produce hyper-local events in their markets. We aim for the kit to include pretty much everything you would need to execute a highly customizable on-brand event. Event kits have allowed us to effectively scale content and assets across the globe while ensuring there's consistency throughout the full experience. Bringing back the theme of experimentation and iteration, we first started developing these event kits in 2020 and have since continued to iterate and improve how we deliver on-brand enablement to our regional partners. Initially, these kits were more like your traditional event in a box, fully packaged content that we expected to be taken and used as is. But we learned over the years that flexibility is the key to the use and success of the kits and the events they support. So as such, they are filled to the brim with templates. Now, this is only a snapshot of what all is included, but to give you an idea, of course, we include all the goodness around brand guidelines, messaging and tone, color palette, typography, imagery, but even audience mindset, how do we want our audience to feel when they're experiencing this event? And for content, we provide a curated sample agenda, presentation templates, video content that our regions can use, panel questions, and of course, options and flexibility to localize the content when needed or personalize the content. We have made it so that our regional partners can swap out customer stories to something that's more relevant for that region. And the kit should absolutely be leveraged for in-person events as well. How to select an on-brand venue, choose on-brand rentals, music playlists, signage templates, speaker wardrobe, you name it. Pretty much all aspects of an event can be downloaded and put into a kit. And I'm sure many of you here today are being asked to scale and do more with the same or less resources. These kits have become an essential tool to scale our resources and brand globally They've ex basically become an extension of our team. So to summarize, to drive brand consistency, stay grounded in your event system, and then scale the brand with an event kit. The final area we'll jump into today is about looking for ways to maintain a two-way street with viewers. When we listen to our audience and take their feedback into consideration, it can lead to better engagement, improved satisfaction, and higher return rates for future events. At Zendesk, we prioritize connecting with our viewers, 
listening and pivoting when needed, and staying agile for regional nuances. Connecting with viewers should go beyond post-event surveys. As event marketers, we need to be on the ground with our attendees to find out what they want and when they want it. We've taken both qualitative and quantitative approaches to seek feedback beyond post-event surveys. So for qualitative feedback, an example I can share is that we were iterating on an event takeaway. It was a digital workbook full of activities for leaders to take back to their teams to improve their CX. We wanted to make sure it was going to be valuable. So what we did was we reviewed the chat log and for anyone who mentioned the workbook, we emailed them post event and asked if they would be willing to provide their thoughts on how we could improve it. Of course, we added an incentive as well, but what we learned was we needed to simplify, which was a great bonus, but we also received deep insights into what our customers found to be most valuable. And for quantitative insights, we wanted to understand how our audience's event preferences have continued to evolve in a post-pandemic world to influence our event strategy. So we sent a robust survey with an incentive, again, to thousands of contacts in our database, anyone who had registered or attended a Zendesk event in the past couple of years. We asked how they prefer to consume content, what size events they find to be the most valuable, how often do they want to attend a digital event, so much more. But the analysis gave us rich insights to influence and build a data-driven global event strategy. So once you have the feedback, it's time to listen and pivot when needed. Here are some examples of how we've pivoted at Zendesk across content development and event experience based on attendee feedback. We started to hear pretty frequently that our viewers were asking for more product related content. We also saw attendees asking very specific product questions in the event chat, often related to their specific use cases or their account, and certainly not helpful to answer over chat. And on one hand, our virtual events are created for both prospects and customers. So we needed to balance how much deep dive product content we put on the main stage. So what we did is we pivoted and added that live office hours to the end of every single event. It was optional, but it gave our customers the forum to get their questions answered. It's staffed with folks from product marketing, solutions consulting, training and education, and the Zendesk experts will actually kick off a conversation about the latest product announcements or tips and tricks. It's a super informal forum, and customers are then able to get their questions answered or glean insights from the conversation and discussion that's being had. The next example is specific, but I think it's relevant because it shows one of those details that feels small, but ultimately impacts the attendee experience. And it's our jobs to pay attention to those small details. So our virtual event agendas typically run for 45 to 60 minutes. But when we first started experimenting with the live office hours, we were hesitant to add that session to the overall timing, making the event you know, 90 minutes. Because at the end of the day, we didn't want to impact the registration conversion with it being a longer event and a bigger commitment. However, we started to see a ton of feedback in the chat with folks specifically saying they wish they had more time blocked on their calendar to attend the office hours or just to have more time to explore some of the other content we had put in the platform. So we extended the, ev the event calendar invite to 90 minutes based on that feedback. And no, it did not affect our registration conversion. It only provided more value to our viewers. And lastly, our audience at some point in the past year started to question the format of the event content. Now, this example, I think, really hits the nail on the head with the need to pay attention to the evolving attendee preferences. For years, we had produced basically television style virtual events, highly produced with transitions and polish a lot of pre and post production. But with so much on demand content at our fingertips now, the only incentive to show up for a virtual event would be for live content and opportunities for participation and interaction. So based on those evolving feedback, we pivoted from our meticulously produced events to curate more organic and raw conversations. 
The final area I will cover today has to do with maintaining a two-way street with your regional partners and adapting to audience preferences across different markets. So as we think about creating and scaling event content across the globe, we keep in mind the content will be consumed by viewers in different languages, cultures, and time zones. So through close collaboration with our regional partners, we've learned more and more about the nuances in attendee preferences that can impact their event satisfaction. For example, our audiences in Korea and Japan, they require a fully localized event experience from the copy in the event platform to the slides on the screen. So when we create event content on the strategic events team, we have to make sure it's flexible and can be fully customized to any language. We've also come to know that Latin America and India audiences often have challenges with internet connectivity, so they have to use more pre-recorded content than what we're doing in America. All this to say, you can't have an event in a box when you're scaling programs globally. Customization is required to, and you have to build your assets with those regional nuances in mind. All right, so to wrap this up here, to maintain a two-way street with your viewers, connect with your viewers, and then listen and pivot when needed. I have done a lot of talking today. Thanks for hanging in there. Um, let's take a look at our key takeaways. So number one, experiment with different formats and in interesting content to keep your attendees engaged. Remember that digital reigns. Prioritize your virtual event and on-demand experience. Drive brand consistency by enabling on-brand events with an event kit and listen to your audience and pivot when needed. So I hope you got some good insights and takeaways to take back to your team, but let's go ahead and see if there's been any questions come in. The, what, the first question was, what was the live transcribing that I mentioned? Um, so we work with uh, a couple different services. Um, Kudo provides live translation services. So it's actually via audio or they do American Sign Language with a video. And then SyncWords provides closed captioning, um, simultaneous closed captioning services for our virtual events. Uh, number two, we have what has been your favorite event to produce so far this year and what were some successes from it? Um, this year, I think... The most favorite event would have to be our customer conference, Relate. Um, so we hosted that in San Francisco for 500 executives. And we saw really, really great engagement, not only from the in-person audience, but from our digital audience. So we actually broadcast our keynote five times over the course of 24 hours uh, to reach an audience of over 10,000. And I just think it's really exciting to be able to take content that is being, um, you know, presented and recorded in a room and share it out more broadly across different languages and regions. Uh, the next question is, is how big is your production crew for producing a video? That is a good question. Um, we do have in-house an in-house video team that has maybe four folks on it. Um, and then we do typically need to get a proper uh, AV crew when we are live broadcasting and producing on site, that can be, you know, another five for your video operators um, and all of the crew required for that live broadcast mixing. Um, okay, next question is, if digital still seems to rain, why do you have more in-person events than you do virtual or do you consider a webinar like a virtual event? Great clarifying question. We do consider webinars and virtual events to still be um, a priority. And so I would I would rope those into the same category. Um, yes, we are prioritizing bringing back in-person events, but with those in-person events, we're still prioritizing our webinars, our virtual events, and the on-demand strategy. So it's not just about hosting the, the in-person event, but what are we, we're recording sessions from the in-person and then posting those online for on-demand consumption as well. Um, okay, next question. How do you build a catalog of video modules and how do you store them? That's a great question. And to be completely candid, I don't know if we've nailed this. Um, 
I think it's really important that you do have some kind of central repository for these videos. The way that we're doing it right now is we work on a cross-functional team for each campaign where we have all of our different work streams involved. And so we're really closely collaborating on the content that's being produced um, and then how can we take that out to our different channels and our different regions. So, you know, we, we run our weekly work stream meetings and that's part of my job on the strategic events team is to pay attention to what's being pr produced on our content team or by our video team and package that up um, to scale that out um, to be used for events more broadly. Um, the next question here is how do you balance the event specific content with supplemental pre recorded content that may get published before or after the actual live event? Um, what we typically do is we want to keep the focus on the live event that is going to take place. So we don't typically share a ton of on-demand content until post-event, um, somewhat as a, a reward or a way to continue to learn um, a bit more about Zendesk and our products or thought leadership. Um, so oftentimes we will actually use um, a video hub post-event where we will post our, our keynote, any other recorded sessions, and then usually any other relevant uh, video content that we have, whether it was from a recent product webinar, um, we really try to collate all of our resources into a video hub for post-event consumption. Uh, the next question here is, do you have any specific visibility recommendations for smaller companies or divisions that are looking to grow attendance at virtual events? Um, good question. I think my first my first gut answer would be to say to really take a look at all of the different cross promotional opportunities you have within your business um, and across your channels. So really partnering with um, your sales and success teams, um, employees can be a great way to help grow attendance by helping to spread the word. And then also look across your marketing efforts. What are all of those cross-promotional opportunities that you can put in an event registration CTA? Is a banner in an email, a banner at the edge, the end of every registration page? Um, so there's always opportunities for you to continue to pepper in uh, the user journey to drive more attendance for all of your events. Um, let's see. Next question, have you seen higher registration for the mixed content events, the ones, the live and on demand? Yes, and I will say that because if we invest in our on-demand strategy, that's just giving our viewers more opportunities to consume the content. So if they couldn't show up for the live event, well, they still have plenty of opportunities to consume the content on their own time. So when we invest in our on-demand strategy, we've directly seen our on-demand views increase. Um, and the next question here is, where do you start on the event kit? Um, great question. I think where you should start is collating all of your brand guidelines. That's really the, the basis of an event kit, right? Is to make sure that anyone who's touching events should at least at a bare minimum be following your brand guidelines. So bring in that event system, bring in um, all of your existing company, company brand guidelines. So even if you don't have a proper event system, at least just arming other cross-functional partners with the resources and tools that they need to create on-brand events is a great place to start. And then from there, I think it's the way that we approach it is how would we be training others to do these events? Um, and that's actually how it started in 2020 when the events team was tasked with partnering with our regional partners on basically guiding them on how to produce online events when we weren't doing in person. And so what we did was we just started creating an enablement kit, um, we, training docs, templates. So anything that you can offload from your own brain and put into a slide is going to be helpful for people who aren't living and breathing it every day like you are. Um, Long-winded winded answer, but brand guidelines and then just think about it as a training tool. Um, next question here, can you elaborate more on the blend between 
virtual, live, and local, and recorded versus live? Yes. So, and I hope I'm interpreting your question here correctly. Um, so what we've done recently in our virtual events in terms of blending live and pre-recorded, um, so we took a, a video that was produced for our campaign. I think it was about 10 minutes, um, highly produced. Um, so we wanted to think about how can we leverage this so that we weren't you know, focusing our resources and time on the pre-production. So we cut that video up into, I think it was five different segments and it was around our trends. So this was for our CX Trends um, annual campaign where we put out customer service trends. So we broke the video up into five pieces and we would share a trend. And then we had a panel discuss that trend and what they're seeing in the market, what they're seeing with their customers. We would play trend number two video, the panel would discuss and so forth. So that still brought polish while um, you know, bringing that live organic conversation to the table. So I hope, I hope that answered your question. Um, last question here is how often do we live stream our in-person events? Typically, because it does require resources, um, both financially um, and human bodies, um, we typically only live stream our biggest marquee events. And so Relate is our flagship conference. We put a lot of investment around live streaming. Um, we're live streaming an upcoming uh, regional event taking place next week. And so really, um, I'd say around our tent pole moments is when we're investing in live streaming. So. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for all of the thoughtful questions. Please feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or connect um, if you want to discuss further. This was great. Thank you.